If you love what you hear, check out our authors Andrea Stewart and N.A. Fulton on Amazon.com, and be sure to subscribe to our Dark Romance Novels and Stories podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite podcast provider. Learn more about us at audioion.com. Pirate's Desire by Andrea Stewart. Prologue. Lady Corwin Tyler Chase, dressed in a warm brown woolen gown and a white molly cap, arrived at the London docks to board the Albatross precisely at four. With her she had five trunks, her new lady's maid and a letter from the ship's owner promising her passage to Virginia. As she made her way up the narrow gangplank, she stared down at the roiling water that filled the gap between boat and dock. There was just a single wide rough plank to walk on and it bobbed up and down violently as the ship moved with the waves. It was with some surprise that she found herself toe-to-toe -to -toe with a hawk-faced first mate. She looked up to find him tall, dirty, bearded, and younger than she would have expected. His grey eyes were narrow with suspicion and everything about him said she had no business on his ship. And what do you think you'll be about lass? He asked. If you will allow me to board, sir. I have a letter from the owner of the Albatross offering me passage. The man did not budge. He looked down the gangplank to the maid in the heavy trunks that stood beside her. We'll be having no women aboard this ship, miss. My master will not allow it. But I have a letter from the owner promising me passage to Virginia. The captain will not sail with women, he said. We have no time to waste on your fancies. We sail with the tide. Corwin, exhausted by the horror and scandal of the last few weeks, considered just letting herself drop into oblivion. It must be fifty feet to the water and if she fell and the ship crushed her against the dock this whole sour business would be done with once and for all. She began again. I have paid for passage. Let me board. And you are travelling alone? Have you no husband or brother? My brother is captain of Her Majesty's ship the Trident. It was he that spoke to the owner of your ship and he who paid my fare. Where is he then? He too sets sail with the tide. On Her Majesty's ship the Trident. Have I not just said that? Your husband commands a navy ship? Enough. Where is your captain? demanded Corwin. Get him now or I swear I shall send for the owner and see you both sacked. Let me see your letter, said the mate, holding out his hand. No. I want to see the captain, Corwin countered. When the man made no move to do as he was bid, she said. Tell me your name. I want to know it so I can tell the owner who barred my way. No need, my lady. I will let the captain speak for himself, the mate said. He rabbited up to the deck leaving Corwin shaken by the sudden movement of the gangplank. Wearily she continued her ascent onto the ship. By the time she stepped down onto its shifting deck the captain was before her. He was dressed little better than his man. He had a greatcoat on and he was arguably cleaner. But still his feet were bare and his wide flat toes gripped the deck like fat fingers. He took Corwin's note stared at it blearily, then looked her up and down. Then he said, I've nature quit tarts at sea, me lady. They wreak havoc with the crew. Corwin interrupted him, violating everything her brother had ever told her about a captain being like to a god on his own ship. She was past having patience with men. There was only one man on earth she feared at this point, and it was due to him that she was leaving the land of her birth like a thief in the night. She had paid for passage, she was on the ship. It was due to sail soon. It was time to put an end to this nonsense. Let me have my cabin so we can get underway, or I will have you cast off this ship. I have paid for passage and I am sure the owner of the Albatross expects his orders to be obeyed. She might have said more but the captain was already instructing the first mate to take up quarters with the second so she and her maid could have a cabin for the crossing. As her trunks were carried onto the ship and then dragged below deck, Corwin looked back toward shore. For once, reason had prevailed. Perhaps she would truly be permitted to escape England with her life. The ship set sail as the day died, 
making its slow way past the other deep sea vessels that crowded the Thames. Corwin saw the ever shifting masts reach upward like the trees of a winter forest, long spars like stark branches were dark against a leaden sky. She saw night overtake the banks of the river as they made for the open sea, looming buildings illuminated only sporadically by the glow of lamp or candle. Wind chilling her face, cloak billowing about her, Corwin felt like she was sailing off the end of the world. Once she had longed to see foreign lands, had prayed she might visit the new world with Ben. Why, she had wondered, could a man become a captain, an adventurer, but a woman could only become a wife, confined to a house, sentenced to care for a family. Was there really no higher aspiration? Was that all the world offered her? To go from daughter to mother with nothing in between? Now she wished for nothing more than her bed at Chase Manor and the peace she had known before she ever came to this city of smoke and misery. Corwin turned to find Margaret, the maid she had met only this morning, standing beside her. The young girl's broad round features were reddened by the wind, her fair hair struggled to escape its pins. She looked entirely at ease. She had family in Virginia, two brothers and a cousin. Corwin envied her. Margaret was rushing off to start a new life while Corwin was merely running away from her past. Corwin, the beloved and unexpected daughter of elderly parents had been born fifteen years after her older brothers. There had been many children born and lost between them. Sons, she had been told, all delivered grey and gasping for breath. When Corwin had come into the world there had been little hope she might survive. She had been christened without fanfare just hours after birth, and she had slept in her mother's bed for a full five years before anyone trusted a sore throat or a bad cough wouldn't carry her off. The merry raven-haired little girl with bright green eyes, a ready wit, and frequently dirty feet, had been coddled by a mother, father, and nurse who doted on her. Her entertainment had been brothers who taught her to ride and shoot better than any boy on neighboring lands. Until she was nine she thought earth was heaven and the world was made for her. And then the iron constitution which had carried her through her childhood betrayed her. Her mother and father and oldest brother had all died, leaving her alone. Scarlet fever had swept throughout the west country filling the land with burning pits and the stench of rotting flesh. Corwin had watched it all disbelieving. To see so many cut down, to watch so many die, had struck her dumb. It was only when her remaining brother, now heir to their parents' small estate, had come home from the sea, that she had come to life again. She had wept, had told him how her father and mother had died in the same bed, refusing to be parted even in agony. She told him how her elder brother had buried them only to fall ill the same day. Lord Benjamin Chase, who had sought the sea from his first breath, left it behind for a decade to see his sister grown into a young woman. He had continued to serve in Her Majesty's Navy in administrative functions, travelling to London for half of every year only to return for the winter months to his sister in the bleak marshes and moors of Land's End. In the fall of this year he had told Corwin she must go to London. Their cousin, the Lady Christina Wakefield, had promised her a home and a coming out. Corwin, at nineteen, was a woman in need of a husband. Ben would return to the sea. He had been offered his first command of a small ship. He would be patrolling the coast of Virginia for pirates. Their lives must part, he told her, for he had no desire to farm. The estates would be her dowry and he would make his life in the new world. She had begged him to take her with him to Virginia and he had declined. The colonies were hard country. She would never be safe amongst the savages and all the rough men of those new lands. Instead he had taken her to London where she had found men who were far more dangerous. Pirate's Desire by Andrea Stewart, voice recording copyright 2019 by Nancy Fulton, music by Alexander Shavarev licensed from Pond 5.